and welcome to the last of our sessions of day 17. We are almost at the penultimate day of vid, which is insane. Um, thank you so much to everyone that has watched the sessions live. And if you're watching this as a recording, it is always good to see the comments in the community as well. Um, this session, we are joined by the wonderful Agnes Nusofwa. Um, Agnes is a global sickle cell disease advocate the founder and CEO of Australian Sickle Cell Advocacy Inc, which was formed because of Agnes and Preston's experience with sickle cell when their daughter was diagnosed in late 2009. A mother of four children, Agnes is a data analyst by profession, but became a registered nurse to better understand sickle cell and, that, and what their daughter was going through. She studied a master's degree in nursing from the University of Sydney before studying for a bachelor's degree in business and a diploma in accounting. And Agnes, it's so wonderful to have you. When I read your story, I was like, I need to, I need to meet this woman. I need to understand someone that is, you know, so willing to go to so many extremes, you know, to shape the future of, you know, sickle cell and, and um, your daughter as well. So thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's, a, it's an honor to finally meet you. And thank you for giving me and the sickle cell community this opportunity. Thank you. What's the best way to start today? You want to share with your story, start with your story? Uh, I guess maybe, yes, I would um, um, talk a little bit about myself and then I'll just run through the slides because I put the prompts just to remind me. So uh, the story about me, it's as it is on paper. I don't know any other way to write it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm a, a, a parent who was um, affected by a disease that I had no idea about. I, we always said, you know, we are a family that comes from a healthy family because we never actually been in hospital in any of our kids. And all of a sudden you find yourself in hospital almost every other week. So that was a shock for me and my, my, my family. So yes, I had to do a bit of extreme things. <laughs> One of the things was to change my career. I was working in one of the big four banks and I just felt that I, I hate not knowing. So I decided to study nursing to understand the sickle cell disease. That is, um, unfortunately, I didn't know about it, but it's very common from people who come from uh, some parts of the world, especially African backgrounds or Mediterranean Italians. So I, I started nursing to understand sickle cell. And from that, after looking after my daughter, I realized there was a gap in Australia and most other people are going through the same. So I decided to start a not-for-profit organization, which is Australian Sickle Cell Advocacy Today. So I did say that I was going to just quickly, so that, that's me, um, my daughter, my youngest of four, who was diagnosed with sickle cell disease and the day she was born. And believe it or not, I think two weeks before this, I was in hospital for eight weeks because I got sick when I was pregnant with her. And that's me sometime this year being a finalist at Wago Health for the work that we do in the sickle cell community. So about me, as I've said, I'm a mother of four. My youngest was the one who has sickle cell. I'm a registered nurse by a profession now, which has come in handy with a data analyst as well. I uh, founded Australian Sickle Cell Advocacy and because of the work we do, I've found myself to advocate for sickle cell globally. I also present sickle cell talks with Agnes on live uh, Facebook since uh, the pandemic, which we've continued up to now. And I created the Amplify Sickle Cell Voices uh, 10 plus 2, which was 12 series where we brought 23 people um, uh, about 40 people in, in the same Zoom room for, uh, from 23 countries. So it's something that uh, we are very happy about as Austrian sickle cell advocacy. So I always start uh, giving my, my life experience and this talk or this presentation is basically one of two things. I want to raise awareness about sickle cell disease that is considered rare in, um, in Australia, but I also tell you 
my story, which is very similar in terms of people that have got sickle cell and their families is very similar the way we find out that we are affected. So sickle cell disease is um, one of the most uh, common genetic disorders in the world and um, it affects um, the red blood cells. So, and I like talking about this using pictures. So the normal red blood cells are these ones on the left side, you know, nice and oval shape. But for somebody who has sickle cell disease, these uh, red blood cells, they break after about 20 days and they become this shape, which is like a sickle, a banana. And that's why the name was called sickle cell. And uh, the normal red blood cells take about 120 days to come out. So it's a hereditary disorder in which the uh, abnormal hemoglobin with the red blood cells causes the cells to be in an abnormal sickle shape. And I've said they take about 120 days, the red blood cells take 20 days. It affects people predominantly from an African background, Mediterranean, Middle East countries such as Italy, Greece, Saudi Arabia, India, Latin America, Caribbean, and the United States. At the moment, there's no pharmacological cure. The only cure that's available is a bone marrow transplant. And uh, there's about other research going on, maybe gene editing will be perfected in the few years to come, but right now the only cure is a bone marrow transplant. And we have about a thousand people estimated in Australia living with this condition at the moment. So I want, also want to talk about the inheritance of sickle cell disease. So what I showed you before, that, that's what happens when somebody has sickle cell disease. But if uh, you are only like me who has carried the gene, there's different probabilities to have. And I put this again, just to show um, again in pictures. So sickle cell is manifested in two forms. So we have the sickle cell disease and we have the sickle cell trait, which is the gene. Two people have to inherit one set of genes from each parent. Uh, a, a person has to inherit uh, each gene from each parent. So these are the different probabilities. Obviously, the ones in red, then mother and father, they both have sickle cell disease, and obviously the child will be born in sickle cell disease. The top right, we have um, one, one of each parent has full uh, sickle cell disease, and one of them just has uh, the gene. So we have these probabilities, 50%. And in every pregnancy, a, a parent, a child will be born in sickle cell disease, and 50% in every pregnancy, the child will have a sickle cell trait. Then on the bottom here, these are the probabilities as well. I, one has a, um, each parent has a gene, like in our case, my husband had the gene, I also have the gene. So we have 25% of every pregnancy for a child to have the sickle cell trait. And um, so this is what happened exactly for us. We, we have one child who's actually two kids, of, our kids are, are okay, and one child has a sickle cell disease and the other one has got the trait. And so these are the different probabilities you can see on the bottom, um, just, you know, wants to be watching this, what happens for. So this is a sickle cell gene, previously was a sickle cell disease. I also want to talk about the complications just to highlight because sickle cell disease is considered an invisible disease it actually affects almost all the organs of the body. And um, because it, it affects the red blood cells and the red blood cells carry oxygen. And in our body, oxygen is like the fuel of, uh, of um, you know, like a car, but oxygen is a fuel for the body. All the organs needs to be fed by oxygen. So you see that almost every organ as per this picture um, is affected by, by sickle cell. So we've got pain episodes because once the vessels get stuck in the um, in the joints, especially, it brings about a lot of pain. And 90 to 95 percent of the people that are affected by this are admitted in hospital with a lot of pain and given high doses of um, uh, pain medications. We have infections, anemia, obviously, because the the red blood cells are uh, broken down easily. We have strokes, we have retinopathy, uh, leg ulcers because we don't have enough oxygen going to the lower limbs, kidney disease, spleen inf uh, infection, and different, different types of infection. Mostly all the organs are affected. And so before, uh, I just wanted to tell you a history a little bit about sickle cell. So now back to my story. Before sickle cell disease, I migrated from Zambia, my home country, in about 19 years now. I had no knowledge, the severity of the disease itself. I knew a little bit about it, but not so much in terms of the complications. I came to Australia, I was working in one of the big four banks. I just graduated from business school. 
and I was, I was working in the tax office back home and I wanted to study masters of taxation. Then we had our first, uh, our fourth pregnancy and everything changed. So that's what happened. That's me in hospital. Um, I got sick and a known disease, spent seven to eight weeks in hospital, two weeks in ICU. And the doctors picked out that I had the sickle cell trait, but they didn't do much with that information. They were looking for something out of this world when the answers were right before them, but they couldn't. Um, they put me on um, try and error medications and they put me on steroids. Unfortunately, I survived, but I was at 67% uh, HP and that uh, they couldn't transfuse me for reasons I don't know. <laughs> I did go back 10 years later to them and ask them that, you, should, you know, you'd have killed me. And um, then my baby was born. There she is. She looks healthy. And we thought this is strange. But as a mom who had three kids before, I knew there was something wrong. I just, there was just that instinct. And this is why I tell parents, obviously, that, you know, you have to um, always remember and always consider those uh, gut instincts. So when she was born, the first few months we are fine, but we started seeing just something. As I said, I had those instincts from six months, she had what they call foot and hand syndrome, where the feet and hands swell because the cells are stuck there and she was in pain. Seven months, again, similar um, complications, but this time she had pneumonia. At nine months, again, pneumonia came. At 12 months, again, the pneumonia came just after having a 12 months immunization injections. I took her to the GP and hospitals. I was staying back three to four times. And within the space of two months, the pneumonia came back. And this time it never went. And that's when we knew that she had the sickle cell. She was diagnosed at 14 months old. That was us in hospital. We stayed in hospital also for her for about six weeks. Her left lung had collapsed. And this was the pus that was coming out from her lungs and they were draining the lungs. She was really sick, but we were happy. And, uh, you know, thank God that we're in Australia, the doctors were able to stabilize her. And that was her after a few days smiling, she, she was okay. So that changed our lives. Um, as I said, I hate not knowing. And I consider and we consider our health, ourselves a healthy family because we had never been in hospital. So it was very difficult to cope. We didn't even know how to, what to do except tell our immediate families because from, being never been in hospital to being in hospital almost every two weeks. Now she had pneumonia, um, anemia, she had pain. And every time we just rushed to us to hospital and because her lungs were destroyed, most of the time we went back for infection for the chest um, and all. Uh, and so I, I thought, how can I portray my story? The only way I know is what I went through. And when I was reading after doing nursing school, I thought what I went through were stages of grief and loss because I just didn't know how to explain it. So I looked at this article by Bastian Linda and um, I thought these are exactly the, the, the situations that I went through. I denied for a while. I just told the doctors that, no, you have it wrong. What they told me, they gave me a diagnosis, by the way, when I was pregnant, something to do with the blood. So I said, no, the, she has what I had when I was pregnant. So go back and we check. I'm sure she'll be fine after a while. Look at me, I'm fine. All you need to do is put her on steroids. I was very angry. And then there was stage of, that stage of bargaining, like, you know, life is not so bad. You know, she's fine. She can still go to daycare and all. And then there was time of acceptance. And that's why I put this picture here when I accepted. I said, this is it. And I went to uni to go and study nursing. And then there was, the, you know, uh, depressive episodes, actually the other way around, acceptance was there, was, um, was the last one, sorry. And so during the denial period, yes, that's what I was saying. I was just like, no way, she doesn't have sickle cell. Go and check her again. She has to still disease, steroids will work and she'll be fine. I had to be convinced to tell me that, you know, definitely she was. And this denial period actually went for a long time. I actually, every time I used to give myself a benefit of a doubt, when she's fine for a few months, I was like, yeah, they got it wrong. Look at her, she's fine. Then the next minute we are running to the hospital because she doesn't have enough blood or she's got an infection. It did go on for a while for, you know, even after I was accepted, there's always, always that benefit of a doubt. And then the anger, I was so angry. And one of the reasons why, because um, 
there is research to back that, you know, if they, they have early diagnosis, if a child has been uh, you know, born with sickle cell, they identified, you know, about six months, they'll start them on antibiotics, we wouldn't have ended up, I, I know we wouldn't have ended up, uh, you know, in ED and having our lungs collapse and surgeries and after surgeries. I was so angry with the, the hospital system. And at, at one point, I actually wanted to sue because I said, this is negligent because they turned me back about three or four times. And they, they saw that I had the sickle cell trait, but they were lucky, looking for something. They're looking for HIV, they're looking for cancer, they're putting cameras under my throat when all they had was beside me. I went to nursing school and it didn't take me long to know that if you are uh, got a compromised immune system or if you're pregnant, you are prone to having a full blown sickle cell disease. And that's what I had. I'm convinced I had a sickle cell crisis when I was pregnant but the doctors were looking for cancer and other things. And also just with my, my parents, and, and I was angry, but I understood where they were coming from. They knew that we had sickle cell, and I think it was something that they would have passed on to us. And I, I sort of forgive them because the, the education system in our country doesn't allow us to go in detail if, if you are not from an, a science background to understand genetics. So, but I was angry at them. I said, you know, I should have told, and I just, I was just angry, God, like God, why me? And you know, so that was a difficult period and it took a while at that stage. And then came the bad bargaining period, as I said, she was fine. That's her in Canberra, that's her with friends that, you know, we went out for a, for some picnic and all, and there were good times, not all bad times, but there were very unpredictable times because would be in Canberra like this in the evening we'll be running to ED because she's got a temperature over 38 degrees, we need to run to ED. Um, and then came the depressive episodes. This was the hardest part because I have a husband who works away and some times of the year, I'm like a single mom in inverted commas. So you have to be strong for first the child you are looking after, but also the other kids who rely on you. But you also have to work because you have to live. And I used to wake about maybe 45 an hour away from home. And those were the hardest periods where I always think when I'm driving and those were the times that I used to cry. So I would use like, you know, crying time. I would cry in the car, come home, clean myself that no one will know. And of course, when I'm in my bedroom and a lot of self blame, I always ask, you know, would I have done anything differently? At this point, I, I'll never have an answer if I'd known whether I had sickle cell trait and my husband had and whether I would end up together, that's a very, big, big question that I'll never answer. And then came the acceptance period. This time, it, I think it took about maybe after three years where I used to tell people that, you know, this is what has happened to us. I'm from Zambia. I started reading and, um, you know, every time I started reading an article, I had hope that there was going to be a cure in my, 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 my daughter's um, uh, lifetime somehow. So I enrolled into um, Sydney Uni to do nursing. I changed, I've got a bachelor's degree in, in uh, business and accounting. I put all my taxation masters in the background. I said, there's no way I can manage this thing. And, you know, then I, I went and did nursing and that was the best thing ever because I took every opportunity to study about sickle cell disease. And so from that time, uh, after reading, and I won't talk too so much about my daughter's experience, but it was a very, very hard time. And, uh, but in everything that happened, they told us that, um, you know, at one point, if you feel that, um, or if advanced medicine in Australia allows, your daughter can be cured by bone marrow transplant because your third child is a donor. And at this point, especially in Australia, to do a bone marrow transplant, they favor to get a 100% uh, donor who's a sibling. Um, and so after chasing the cure in three different states, and, and that episode was started in my living room. I was in, in Sydney watching TV at one point, and I saw this doctor on TV talking about a bone marrow transplant. I got a screenshot and I contacted that doctor and uh, she said, you know what, once you, you come to Melbourne, come and see me. I said, no, we are coming this weekend to come and see you. And uh, through that different consultations and different changes in uh, the medication, especially the chemo, we knew about the transplant in 2011, but we had to wait because there was no, the, the chemo at the time was going to be aggressive on our damaged lungs. 
So we moved to Melbourne in 2013, hoping and waiting for that light that the doctor showed us that there'll be light at the end of the tunnel. And that light came in about 2018. The doctors were confident that yes, the chemo is uh, the, uh, what they call reduced skin conditioning is on the market and we can start talking the, the cure. Because at this point she was having red cell exchange every four weeks. We are in the hospital almost every two weeks, every three weeks doing the matching and non-stop checkups at one Saturday, I was asking myself, God, why am I in an MRI machine room waiting for my daughter to do an MRI on a Saturday morning? Uh, those are the questions I used to ask myself. But God answered our prayer. And in 2011, 2019, on the 21st of February, she had a bone marrow transplant. The same doctor who I saw on TV, she managed to cure my daughter. And now today she's over, 270 something days bone marrow after the bone marrow transplant she's cured from sickle cell disease so in a nutshell in a brief nutshell that's my story about my family but what did this experience teach me i always uh, hold on to my faith i'm a very strong christian and i'm proud to say it i i never give up hope in everything that happens in my life and a lot of things do happen in my life i'm always hopeful I do trust my instincts. I always tell people that I, I'm a very good, I, I read people's characters and most of the time and everything that happens to me, to me I trust my instincts. To be tolerant in a critical situations because I had no control and my daughter was in hospital for 40 days. I felt helpless and I just had hope that I held on to like it's still in my arms. I just had hope. I'm always thankful that, you know, finally she's cured and uh, from this, I decided to start using my voice. And even before, um, I started using my voice to just raise awareness and to fight for others who don't have uh, a voice about this condition. So um, a message to, I always try to, to put in this message to caregivers that you, again, believing your instincts, because I did say at the beginning that I knew there was something wrong with my daughter. And I kept telling the doctors that look after her, do a blood check and do a full, but they didn't listen to me. But today is a different story. If I have an instinct, the doctor will have to act on that. You know, um, advocate for your child, your, your child's advocate in everything that you do. Pay attention to the triggers, especially if you're still living with the sickle cell. The triggers are very important to act upon. Immediately the trigger comes, do something to eliminate that trigger. Partner with the experts, that really helped us. We have a very good relationships with the hospital system. And uh, again, if nothing works, you. It's, it's okay, even the doctors know this, it's, there's no harm, get a third or fourth, fifth or sixth opinion so that you're just okay in your heart that everything is fine and do not give up hope. The hope is something that I held on to like I saw it. Um, and so now I'll talk about my main story and I'll be quick. Uh, road to sickle cell advocacy. Why did I start talking about this? So I realized there was a gap in Australia when I started looking for help. I was so helpless. I needed somebody to speak to who was going through the same I was going through. But I ended up going to social media to go and find that person. And that time, I think Messenger was an introduced where you can call anyone. So I did just texting or something. And I started this by joining different Facebook groups. But those Facebook groups made me actually more depressed because of the things that I saw. So what I decided after a few months, um, a few years actually of relying on information on Facebook, I exited most of the Facebook groups because the things that people go through in the sickle cell space, they are so depressing sometimes. And so I decided to take control. And in 2014, I opened my own Facebook page. And uh, this is where, for me, it was a way of coping, a coping mechanism where I wanted to take control. And and I said positive news. I knew about gene therapy a long time ago. I was following people who have done bone marrow transplants, getting in touch with doctors abroad when they, they've cured somebody about bone marrow transplants. Having somebody like an actress who's a sickle cell patient, those stories are things that I have to post on my Facebook page because I had the control. And um, then I decided that, you know what, I think I need to open a, a not-for-profit organization because of the questions that we started getting, even from people in Australia. But I didn't do that just then. I needed to understand sickle cell in Australia. So I started now looking 
at uh, understanding sickle cell prevalence. So I, I decided to get in touch with the doctors to just read a lot about sickle cell, finding out from the human de uh, department of, to find out what was happening in the sickle cell space. So I needed to understand uh, what was happening before we could do that not-for-profit organization. Uh, I looked at the issues, for example, now this year, I think last year, the doctors are saying uh, about estimated 1,000 people. Before, I think maybe there were about five or 700 people uh, in sickle cell disease. So we, we were studying the issues that are, uh, people by sickle cell disease are impacted. So again, just digging deep, we find out that you know, there's no for example, we didn't have a, a, um, a data registry even up to now. It's not accurate. This is estimated. We sickle cell disease is not sort of um, recognized in, in, in Australia. You have to go hurdles to apply for healthcare card. There's no newborn screening. There's no prenatal screening mandatory. So all these things, and especially newborn screening, definitely no. Prenatal screening, it's there on different hospitals. And one of the hospitals where my daughter was born, because I took them to task, and the year after she was born, they introduced prenatal screening as at least for mothers who come from risky countries. But it's not a mandatory um, test that happens. And um, there's no uh, clinical guidelines. So all those issues, we started investigating what the issues were for us to actually know what to do once we start the not-for-profit organization. We reached out to the experts uh, across the country um, because it's considered a rare disease. So we see that in all these hospitals, we may have one or two specialists in, in sickle cell. That's Dr. Anthe Greenway. We call her the, the, the sixth or seventh member of our family. She was my daughter's uh, hematologist from 2013 until she, we were transferred to oncology. She's an expert at the Royal Children's Hospital. So we see that every hospital, maybe we may maybe just have one or two men uh, uh, doctors to treat sickle cell. So it was very easy for us to partner with them and to understand the prevalence and the issues that is going on in the sickle cell community. And then uh, the time came, I was like, okay, I have this information. So what do I do with this information? So I started looking at um, like-minded people. And these were people who caregivers who has uh, children with sickle cell disease. We have adults, you know, believe it or not, who are born in Australia over the age of 60 and they had never found an organization solely for sickle cell and they had never met a patient or somebody who was affected by sickle cell. And when they found us on social media, they were so happy. So I found all these people that, okay, now I think we are ready. And we also, you know, it's a, it's a few community here and there and you know how Melbourne is. We also had to find some, some professionals and supporters to help us. And we found, we made a board who's right now we're headed by Dr. Margaret Evans Kali and a few scientists, some people come from business world, some from public health. And now we are confident that we can do this even if we don't have experience and we learn by mistakes every day. We decided to open a not-for-profit organization in October, 2018. We started off immediately, we registered like this week, the following week, we started off going in the community and that's where I met a few people. Uh, by 2019, uh, on the 19th of June, which is World Sickle Cell Day, we decided to have an official launch. And at that time, my daughter was in hospital. And yes, I planned the launch in the hospital. That was my way of coping. I was with my computer 24 seven planning the launch even though we decided that, oh, it's a small thing, I'm in hospital, just going to invite 50 people. We ended up having to increase 50 more tickets uh, on Eventbrite and 40 more tickets. And we had 140 people at our launch at the Royal Children's Hospital. And that's our team at the day of the launch. Right now, we started off in Melbourne. We are now in all the five major states in Australia where we have people mostly that are affected by sickle cell disease. We have over 20,000 social media connections across all social media, including my pages. And we are recognized by the Federal Minister of Health and the State Minister in Victoria at some point. Uh, other states are also recognized and um, for the work that we are doing. And uh, we're just so happy that finally we have people um, that, for example, Peter, Peter was born here, had never, never seen a sickle cell patient until he was in his late 50s and now it belongs to this organization. 
So, and then came the running of the organization, like, where do you start from? You know, we started this, it's so easy to have it on paper, you know, you're reading, but how do you run that organization? For me, I go with the passion. I go with the feeling I had from the first time I realized that I didn't have support and work my way through. I ask people around, this is Nicole Mills, she, she's a CEO of Rare Voices, they've been very helpful to us. Where I'm stuck, I ask other organizations, it's a learning curve every day, but there are a lot of challenges, a lot. <laughs> but it's very rewarding once you make that difference, I, uh, to be honest. Um, and so after that, the real work started. Immediately after we, we started doing that, we said, okay, where do we start from? The Mount Cultural Department, Department of Mount Cultural, we started going in different events. We are invited to go and present. We invited to go and take some information. This was at a Somalia day, I think sometime in 2019 before the COVID. And um, just knowing all the matters in the sickle cell space so that we can be able to provide that information to the different people that are affected. Ch challenges, as I said, a lot of them. A lot of them, I don't know how many doors we've, or we've knocked and how many doors have been slammed in our, in our face or they haven't been opened at all. People just don't respond to your emails and that's something that we've accepted. Whoever wants to accept and work with us, we, we, we thank them. If they don't, it's okay. And uh, we know we have all these nice object, of objectives. Uh, this is what we want, we want newborn screening, we want healthcare cards, we want, uh, you know, uh, guidelines, and we want other drugs in Australia, but then it's so easy when it's on paper, but it's very difficult to implement because you don't have the control. So all you can do is just fight and fight and don't give up because you are depending on others. You have to be persistent because if you, if you lose hope, right, by this time would have stopped, to be honest. Uh, and the more you work, the more pushback. The more you work, the more negative things that you receive from, you know, for example, when we had the, we had the launch, we had a public figure, a minister of some, of some sort, writing one of Honorable Maria Van Bakina, who's been very good to us. She's also a, a, a federal member of parliament in my constituency. She was able to officially launch our organization but we had some ministers writing her to discourage her to be, uh, you know, because we started advertising her and people are writing her that she shouldn't come and uh, be, you know, um, be a, a VIP because apparently when you are in, 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 in Australia and you are this girl, I think, you can't start a not-for-profit organization because people will tell you that you're doing this for money. And yes, that happened. That was on the 19th of June. One of the people in this picture somewhere came to me after the, the launch and said, no, the Department of Health has sent me. Why are you starting this organization? Because there's another similar organization. Are you doing this for money? I was like, okay, you tell them to watch me and see where we go from here. So those are the things that we've, we've encountered as an organization and very challenging. And for us, we've seen because you know, there is evidence to show that these conditions affect people that come from the minorities, people that come predominantly from Africa. And this condition has been neglected for so long. It took over 80 years to have a drug specifically for sickle cell disease by mistake. It was a cancer drug. Then they, they realized that it increased the fetal hemoglobin. That's not affected by sickle cell disease. That's how it came. It took few more years to find out that, oh, Actually, bone marrow transplant can cure sickle cell disease by mistake when they wanted to cure leukemia in, in a sickle cell patient. So there is evidence to show and suggest that, you know, the sickle cell community has been neglected for so long. And for me to be an African person in Australia, that's double trouble. But I, it's, a, it's a good trouble that I've put myself in that I've just said, what, you know, I'm going to persevere and I won't give up. So we just have to accept the challenges as we go. So what drives me, you know, almost people live uh, about uh, a thousand people live in the sickle cell disease in Australia. That's what drives me. One of them was my daughter, but we're still not completely out because she still has to do uh, different, uh, you know, checks here and there. One of them is my niece. One of them is my friend. And that really drives me. There's not much therapies in Australia available. At the moment, there's only that one drug I told you about, hydroxyurea which also didn't come in Australia because of sickle cell disease. 
there's complications there how you get that drug because the company that brought that drug in Australia said it wasn't brought for sickle cell disease so we can't do some of the things that we asked for but it's there we've got three other drugs abroad that are still need to come to Australia and we're hoping at some point they will be and just a continuous therapy and uh, maybe research in Australia is, which is much research is missing so that's something that really drives me. But most importantly, I'm somebody who comes from an African background and we have, we've got uh, a lot of people that are dying, especially babies in Africa below the age of five dying because of sickle cell disease. We have over 250 million people living with sickle cell trait and most of them won't even know that they have sickle cell trait. And so for me, I've taken it up upon myself to continue raising awareness, to encourage people to actually get tested and know their sickle cell status. A message to would-be advocates, do your research. If you want to do this kind of work, have the passion, always remind yourself your initial passion. Why did you start this? Have the patience, as I said, be persistent. It's not an easy road, but it's, it's something very rewarding once you do. And before I finish, finally, just, you know, that since we started uh, our work in 2018, We've had a lot of uh, rewards that we, we, those are the things that we, that really drives us. There's so many negatives, but we throw them in the bin, but what are the things that really positive to us? We've been recognized by the health minister and by we, I mean the sickle cell community because for over 60 years, the oldest person that I know, I think it's about 70, the health minister in Australia never said anything about sickle cell disease until we came on board and for two years in a row, is recognize those people living with sickle cell disease. We've advocated for the sickle cell disease guidelines, which the doctors have started because of COVID, everything has been put in place. We have advocated for red cell treatment exchange in, in Western Australia. And all this time, I have families, we came together almost 18 years ago. We've got people in, in Western Australia. They never had the red cell exchange until this year, last year after talking about it for two years, now the red cell exchange has started in Western Australia. We have created a sickle cell course for healthcare professionals, it's on our website. We are forgetting for change in, change, in changes in the blood donations in the African um, ethnicities with the red uh, blood cell, Australian blood cell, life, life blood, the, the name throws me sometimes. So we're advocating for change so that people know if you have the sickle cell trait and what you should do in terms of blood donations, because again, this was another life story where I, I donated um, plasma for so long only to be told that if you've got sickle cell trait, you can't donate. So I'm trying to advocate for, for people to understand that. And also in, we are in the process of advocating for prenatal screening in Australia to be mandatory. We are also doing information uh, documents in, in, in schools and employment. And uh, Australian uh, stakeholders right now, people know that the sickle cell disease because there's so much information that we are getting and communication from different people finding out about sickle cell in Australia. We, for the first time ever again in Australia, we are having a conference in September 17th and 18th. Uh, we have a global reach of over 100,000 people on, on social media, especially our different so our Facebook pages. Uh, we've been doing Zoom sessions during the pandemic globally to advocate for sickle cell. And this is where I found myself without even planning that I have actually been connected to people around the world where we brought 23 um, countries together, over 40 people. We are starting another session sometime in April. And I want to normalize talking about sickle cell disease because this condition uh, is really attached to stigma. A lot of people don't want to talk about it, especially people that come from an African background. And that's why I brought the Sickle Cell Talks with Agnes on Facebook, where people come and share their stories. We do education sessions with our professionals and just highlighting every day why it's important to talk about sickle cell disease more. And finally, I want to invite you to come and join us on the 17th and 18th of September for the virtual conference, the first one ever in Australia. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity and uh, the, the Sickle Cell community, we thank you again. Thanks, sir.